Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you back here for another video. This particular video is going to be about the industrialized democracies during World War II. We're going to look at some of the Western countries. Now, unfortunately, we don't have infinite time, so we're not going to look at every Western country, but we are going to look at a couple of them as examples of what's going on around the Western world after World War II. And so, of course, the first country, as you can see here on the slide, that we're going to deal with is the United States. Now, in this world history class so far, we've pretty much deliberately avoided the United States and American history because, of course, we're looking at things from a world perspective. However, after World War II, the United States becomes a really big deal, and in fact, it becomes a superpower. One of the reasons for that is World War II itself, because in World War II, our factories, our ports, most of our stuff did not get ruined and damaged. Whereas in Europe and in Asia, their economies and their countries are absolutely ruined by World War II. Whereas the United States is massively ramping up production of everything from food to machinery to, to just absolutely everything. And everybody else around the world has to buy that stuff and they have to buy it from us. So humongous amounts of goods are flowing out of the United States after 1945, and humongous amounts of wealth is flowing into the United States after 1945. So World War II really in the long run was very good for us, and we can see that here. When you look at GDP, GDP is a measure of the American economy, of any economy. And here what you can see is pretty much from 1945 all the way through 2008 and the Great Recession, the American economy sometimes slowed down in how fast it was growing, but really we didn't have a major recession at all from 1945 until 2008. Our economy grew and grew and grew and grew and grew, and that gave us this status of being a superpower. Now, in addition to that, of course, we're, we're the leading country in NATO. We are seen as the defenders of the free world uh, from communism. And the United States, this really does become the American century from 1945 through to the end of the century. However, domestically, and, and we're only going to do this very briefly because it's just kind of to set you up for what you're going to do next year in American history class. Domestically at home in the United States, we did have a couple of important things that we want to just briefly touch on. Number one is people after World War II had this sense of unity and togetherness and kind of national pride and national identity. And one of the things they had to deal with when they got home from World War II really challenged that idea of kind of nationalism. And that idea was called segregation, this kind of separation of the races of black people versus white people and separate schools and separate public facilities and things like that. It was very similar to what we had seen in South Africa's apartheid system. Um, after World War II, this kind of sense of national unity, people started to challenge that. They thought to themselves, if we can unify and work together to fight World War II, why can't we have the same drinking fountains or the same restrooms or the same schools? And so people after World War II really started the fight for civil rights. One of those people, of course, very famously, is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who led the civil rights movement of the 1950s, which eventually would become uh, successful and would acknowledge and, and reconcile this black movement to create equal opportunities for people in the United States. That was successful. Segregation was overturned in the 1950s and then again even you know, further into the 1960s. And racial segregation came to an end. Now, following that, of course, we did have other people who started to challenge this system of oppression. And of course, following the success of, of racial uh, civil rights, we also saw that women started the women's movement and uh, feminism, second wave feminism, uh, where they were pushing for the end to barriers that prevented them from enjoying enjoying full equality in the United States. And of course, the women's movement by and large starts at the end of the 60s and continues through the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and then even to a certain extent, it continues all the way up till today. So these kind of civil rights movements are a major feature of the United States and other countries in the West following World War II. The second big feature in addition to, or the third big feature, I guess, in addition to the civil rights movements and the enormous economic growth was also a social change in the United States. States. And again, this is pretty much seen in other Western countries as well. And that is a process called suburbanization. One of the things we see after World War II is that we're producing so much. And one of the things we're producing in huge quantities is cars and houses. 
people then had a choice not to live in industrialized cities anymore. They could work in a factory in a city, but they could live in a suburb, and we had the ability to produce enormous quantities of relatively low-cost houses and cars to facilitate them living away from the place where they worked. And so we found suburbanization becomes another feature of this kind of Western style of life following World War II. At this point, we're going to leave off with the United States, and we're going to move to another Western country because the, other, the next Western country really gives us another example of what happens in the second, at the end of the Second World War to the Western democracies, and that country, of course, is the United Kingdom. Now, a couple of things to notice, of course, is by the time we get after World War II, after World War II, and really after 1926, most of the island of Ireland is now an independent country. So when it comes to the United Kingdom, the four pieces we've got are the northern piece of Ireland, Scotland in the north, England in the south, and Wales in the west. Those four pieces are what still makes up the United Kingdom. Now, after World War II, they had an election, and uh, Winston Churchill lost this election, and they elected a man named Clement Attlee to be their new prime minister. And Clement Attlee's government was a labor government. He really started to look at the idea that said, after 1942, the Beveridge Report was put out that said, ultimately, the United, uh, the United Kingdom's government is doing such a good job controlling the country during the war, maybe our government should just continue to control the country after the war, and we could produce the best possible outcomes for everybody. To do that, though, what we had to do, or what the, the United Kingdom had to do, was they had to control what they called the five giants of road, uh, the five giants on the road of reconstruction. First, they had to control want, disease, ignorance, squalor, and idleness. So they had to do things like they had to subsidize school meals so students got to have free lunch at school. They did things like nationalizing a lot of their big industries like coal and steel and railroads, things like that. They guaranteed free public education to all students up to age 15. They also created what was called the NHS, the National Health Service. Basically what that means is that everybody in the United Kingdom pays for health care and then whenever you need it, it is available there as a public service. Um, beyond that, what we see is that this is really, by and large, a push into sort of a semi-socialist kind of a uh, style of, of life. They, did they were still capitalist countries, however, they incorporated some elements of socialism because, of course, their governments were in charge of running quite a bit of their economies. Beyond them, we see Germany, and of course here we're going to talk most especially about West Germany because East Germany was part of the communist bloc and they weren't going to see this same kind of experience that we're going to see from both West Germany and Japan. Now, this is an important feature because, of course, after World War I, one of the major issues was the blame that the Treaty of Versailles and the punishment that the Treaty of Versailles levied against Germany and the defeated Central Powers. After World War II, with the division of Germany, and then of course with the occupation of Japan, instead of punishing them and instead of forcing them into a position of just horrible, awful, terrible living conditions, the United States, through NATO, decided that Western Germany should be rebuilt because if it was rebuilt, that would prevent them from becoming communists because, of course, desperation is what pushes people towards communism. So, under Konrad Adenauer, who is the, the leader of Western Germany at the time, what we see is massive, massive investments into the German economy, so much so that we refer to this as the German economic miracle. So on the blue line, you can see that after World War II, Germany is just obliterated. It's destroyed. They lost huge amounts of people and technology and equipment and factories and production and everything else. And the concern was if they're in that bad of a shape after World War II, right, imagine the next World War, right? If Germany lost World War I and then Hitler was the result of that punishment, imagine how bad it's going to be after World War II and how far they've fallen. In actuality, what we see, though, is by the time we get to the 1960s, Germany's economy has, West Germany's economy has grown so incredibly much that actually they outpace where they would have been had they just continued to grow at their normal rate without the world wars. 
This is what we call the German economic miracle, and Germany becomes the biggest economy in Europe, which they still are to this day. Germany's, West Germany's economic miracle was absolutely amazing to everybody watching it. They came from the lowest of the low to being the highest of the high. And beyond that, what we also see is Japan, of course, another conquered country during the Second World War. However, the same provisions were made for Japan as they were for Germany, where Japan goes through another economic miracle. The United States helps them to rebuild, and eventually, of course, what you can see there is eventually the Japanese economy in the 1980s and the 1990s actually surpassed our ally in the United Kingdom. That's how much we helped them to rebuild and reconstruct. Now, when you see uh, cities like Tokyo, this is, of course, modern Tokyo. It is a massive, powerful, economically successful and prosperous Six, you know, Western country, which is having enormous amounts of success. So for today, this is where we're going to leave off. In the next video, we're going to jump in back into the Cold War uh, conflict, and we're going to look at how communism spreads to Eastern Asia. And so we're going to look at China, we're going to look at Korea, um, and from there we're going to move on again into communism spreading into Southeast Asia, and then for Section 5 of the Cold War, we're going to look at how the Cold War comes to an end and how we advance into the contemporary world. So I hope everybody is staying healthy. I hope everybody is staying safe. Make sure you like this video, leave a comment, or leave me a question in Google Classroom. Subscribe to get the notifications for when the new videos come out, and I will see you guys in the next video.